Electric by a color fast alert. If you want in touch with Facebook or New York South, or visit the open touch the new display located near the Lunar Theater. At the Lunar Theater, located at the nose end of the Saturn V rocket, you can relive the experience of Neil Armstrong's historic landing and first steps on the moon. We pride that we present the story of NASA's Apollo program, the greatest adventure mankind has ever undertaken. When I was a kid, I used to dream about flying through space. Every week on TV, I'd watch my heroes jump into their rocket ships and took to the sky. And I wanted to be like them. They had courage, imagination, and no problem ever stood in their way for long. You know, in the end, when we actually did send men into space, it turned out that those were exactly the qualities it took. I'm John Hudson. This is Pad 39 of the Kennedy Space Center. I was a launch controller here when from this very spot, man took off to fly to the moon. It was a journey that began 12 years before that rocket ever left the ground. And it started on the other side of the world. Back then, we were one of two superpowers that always seemed to be on the edge of a terrible war. In 1957, the Soviet Union launched the first ever man-made satellite into Earth orbit. They called it Sputnik, which means traveling from heaven. In a world where peace hung in a delicate balance, it seemed to create a dangerous advantage. Every ham radio operator in America could hear it beep. People were afraid. Were the Soviets looking down on us? Watching us? If they could make a satellite pass over our cities, could they do the same with a bomb? Our own space program kicked into high gear, and less than two months later, we were ready to launch our own satellite. It was being called the Space Race. We fell even further behind. Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the first man into space, circling the world in just 89 minutes. We had our own astronauts, and they were eager and ready to take the big ride. But our manned space program couldn't seem to get off the ground. We stuck with it, and on May 5th, 1961, things finally started going right. Astronaut Alan Shepard took his ship Freedom 7 six and a half miles into space. America had its first space hero. Just a few days later, our space program received a new challenge. But this one did not come from the Soviet Union. It came from our young president. In one inspiring moment, he changed the mission from one based in fear of the present to one of hope for the future. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago fly the Atlantic? Why does Christ play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. design a rocket the size of a 36-story office building, put it together with the precision of a microscope, and accelerate it to the speed of a bullet. Then, we would have to guide it to a moving target 250,000 miles away. Many people thought it was an impossible dream, but 400,000 of us set about making that dream a reality. It would be the longest, most hazardous voyage that any man had dared to attempt. But step by step, mission by mission, we orbited the Earth, perfecting the skills and technologies we would need on this incredible journey. Our astronauts 
practiced maneuvering, docking, and the thousand other tasks that would comprise the moon mission. We created new alloys, lighter and stronger than anything seen before. We designed communication systems that would be reliable over the vast distances. And behind it all, we tried to perfect the rocket that would be powerful enough to punch out of Earth orbit and take us to the moon. One day, however, the dream of flying to the moon almost slipped away. It was January 27, 1967. Astronauts Virgil Gus Grissom, Edward White, and Roger Chaffee were on board Apollo 1 for a plugs out test, a full-scale dress rehearsal for the actual launch. Suddenly it happened. There was a fire in the gaps. Three men whose lives had been in our hands were lost. Surely the opening vistas of space promise high cost and hardships as well as high reward. But this country of the United States was not built by those who waited and rested and wished to look behind them. After Apollo 1, some thought we'd failed and that the moon was out of our reach. But we owed it to those men to learn from their sacrifice and to carry on, we started taking the Apollo vehicle apart, piece by piece. Was the design flawed? Had safety been compromised? Tough questions. And we spent one and a half years redesigning the spacecraft so that no astronaut's life would ever be at risk because we overlooked something or because we could have done something better. A moon rocket is 91% high explosive and it goes into the most unforgiving hazardous environment there is. We could never make it risk-free, and the men who flew them knew that. We didn't send men into space again until Apollo 7 orbited the Earth testing some of the new design. When everything worked perfectly, the decision was made. The next mission would travel to the moon. It was mankind's destiny to leave the shores of our planet behind and strike out across the vast ocean of space. In the great span of our history, now is the time that we could. Now is the time that we would. We stood on the eve of the longest, most dangerous journey that any man had ever undertaken. And it would be taken by Frank Borman, James Lovell, and William Anders, the crew of Apollo 8. Through those doors, you'll find the firing room, launch control, just as it was on December 21st, 1968. Please gather all of your belongings, take small children by the hand, and proceed through the open doors to firing room number one. All doors, Please watch your step and use the handrails on the stairs. Continue moving forward in order to make room for the guests entering behind you. Guests with special physical needs, including wheelchairs and hearing disabilities, please be seated in the front row.
for the comfort, safety, and viewing pleasure of all our guests, we ask that you refrain from flash photography for the duration of our presentation. If you must leave during the presentation, please exit through the doors on your right. Thank you. Do you 
Now, uh, on the other side of those doors, you'll find an actual Samphai Luma. It's still the most powerful, the most complex machine ever built. And I guess it's the only one that can take you to another planet. I actually got to fly on the second flight in Rome called uh, Apollo 13. But uh, that's another story. Ladies and gentlemen, please watch your step and use handrails while on the stairs. As a courtesy to others, we ask that there be no smoking or flash photography during the presentation.
As soon as the eagle reappears, things begin to go wrong. Radio communications break down. Messages to Eagle must be relayed through Mike Collins aboard the command module Columbia. Throughout the crucial final checks, contact with the Eagle keeps dropping out. And flight director Gene Kranz inches closer to aborting the mission. With the vital computer links temporarily holding, the moment of decision is now. Okay, I'll flight controller is gonna go for landing. Retro. Go. I don't go. I go. Control. Go. Telcom. Go. GNC. Go. Econ. Go. Surgeon. Go. Capcom. We're go for landing. Eagle, get the gear. Go for landing. Over. Hurtling toward the moon at 3,800 miles per hour, Neil Armstrong notices his checkpoints are all appearing too soon. This means a serious navigation error. At these speeds, three seconds long means missing the safe landing zone by three miles. Suddenly, the computer starts firing the maneuvering thrusters, jolting the ship back and forth. This has happened in simulations, but never this much, never this violent. The smooth descent is becoming a bumpy ride. Before that is fixed, a problem with the onboard computer. The astronauts have rehearsed for thousands of possible malfunctions, but not this one. It had been considered too unlikely. Seconds seem like hours as everyone struggles to remember the meaning of a 1202 program alarm. The deadline to safely aboard is vanishing fast. 1202 means the Eagle's onboard computer is overloading. This means Houston is blind, unable to make navigation corrections or interpret the data coming from Eagle's computer. Armstrong and Aldrin are on their own. Mission Control decides they can go ahead. If the data link doesn't fail again. 1,000 feet, and Neil Armstrong can see that the computer is proposing to put them down in a dangerous place. That landing site is full of boulders. If they land there, they will never take off again. At 350 feet, Armstrong ignores his computer navigation and veers away from the rocky landing site with no time to explain to mission control. Okay, I'll fly controller at that time. In mission control, everybody is stunned. At 300 feet, the Eagle has left its flight plan and taken off at full speed across the face of the moon. Eagle, Houston, it's descent to fuel. Monitor, over. 90 seconds of fuel remaining. Now less than 200 feet, and the Eagle is too low to safely abort back into orbit. They call this part of the flight plan Dead Man's Curve. No level. No level. All that's left for mission control is to read off the fuel remaining in seconds. 60, 60 seconds. 60 seconds. The entire moon landing has come down to two men and one minute.
A short time later, history is made again. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. For one incredible moment, we are one people with one history, watching our destiny unfold. It was a moment shared by an entire world. With these first steps, mankind stood on the highest ground, and we saw our planet as our home port in the endless ocean of space. There was something which was surprising to me that occurred as I was standing on the surface just after we had landed, I'd gone down, standing on the surface, and looking at planet Earth for the first time, uh, seeing the beauty, seeing the, the finiteness of it, the, the limits of it, uh, and realizing what a shame it was that people were confronting each other on that planet without realizing what it was doing to the planet. It was a very emotional moment for me. I actually shed a couple of tears. Uh, something totally unexpected for, for an engineer and fighter pilot to be, to be crying up quietly up there on the moon. Mankind had achieved a tenuous foothold in the heavens, and a new and exciting world lay waiting to be explored. The first mission had stayed for only one day, but over the next three and a half years, five more Apollo missions visited the moon, and with each one, we stayed longer, roamed further, and discovered more. I never thought when I was a kid building rockets, you know, in high school, that we would go to the moon, you know, before the end of the, of, of the century. I thought that was something that was way in the future, fantasy. <laughs> We've got to understand that as a people, we need to stretch, we need to reach beyond our grasp, we need to strive to do things that seem impossible because in the accomplishment of them, we move society forward. One of the astronauts has said, those hills that we climbed give our children and grandchildren a different perspective that they see the mountains that we couldn't see. And so what we consider impossible, they're dreaming. Millions of other galaxies that you might be able to live in. It's the unknown. 
Anything's possible. You may be able to cure certain diseases. My Mars and Dan Sinek can play basketball, but you can still be short. Because then you could like fly up in the air. Baseball would be awesome. Hit the ball, you get a home run every time. There are a lot of things that can benefit mankind that we because of science we simply cannot do on Earth. It's such a big universe and it's kind of strange to think that just this one tiny planet was chosen to have life on it. I hear they're finding new planets or moons and find out more about how stars are working and it makes me feel like it's trying to tell me something. What's it trying to tell you? That you belong up there with them. The Apollo program ended in December of 1972, but our journey into space is just beginning. I'm Neil Armstrong. The future of space travel is being written right now in the dreams and imaginations of a new generation. Perhaps that's the greatest legacy of Apollo. It shows our children and grandchildren that with courage, imagination, and the will to explore, no dream is impossible. Please watch your step as you exit the theater. On behalf of NASA and the Kennedy Space Center, thank you for visiting the Apollo Saturn Center today.